Welcome to the World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco, and again today we're privileged to have with us Eric Karlstrom. Now, Eric and I set this interview up because he had been doing some deep research into Alan Dulles. And a lot of people, including me, don't know to the extent to which Alan Dulles was involved in creating this problem that we're struggling with with the New World Order now. So I'm going to welcome Eric to uh, the World Beyond Belief and uh, have him uh, just get started on his uh, on what he's found. Hi, Eric. Welcome to World Beyond Belief. Yeah. Good morning, Paul. It's great to be talking to you again across our uh, continents here. You in right. Ecuador and me in Colorado. Right. And uh, yeah, the subject of Alan Dulles is. Uh, I, I've been working on this article about him. Uh, oh. You know, off and on for a number of months and uh, Alan Dulles of course was the first head of the CIA between under Eisenhower between 1953 and 1961 so he was uh, America's spy master during the beginning of the Cold War and uh, you know his brother John Foster Dulles at the same time was Secretary of State so the two of them probably exercised a lot more power. Well, there's undoubted, no doubt, that they exercised a lot more power than President Eisenhower, who was, uh, like most of our presidents, a puppet. Um, now, the reason that I found this subject so important is that I have begun to realize through my reading and my research that the CIA <laughs> runs our country. Yeah, <laughs> and has has run our country uh, ever since it was formed back in 1947. That means all of our lives, Paul. Uh, pretty much, uh, we have had a system that is run by intelligence agencies on behalf of, of course, Wall Street, the City of London, the the uh, international bankers, um, the the global power structure. Now, we, you and I have done some very interesting interviews, and we've featured uh, the Tavistock Institute out of Britain. Well, of course, it was MI6, Britain's MI6, that, that created our OSS, Office of Strategic Services, uh, right near the tail end of World War II, which morphed into the CIA. So the, the uh, Anglo-American alliance uh, has been uh, operating on many levels for well over a century. Um, now, before we get into it, uh, let me just mention for the benefit of our listeners that I have an article on my uh, 911nwo.com website, which is now quite extensive, and the article is called Alan Dulles, America's Greatest Spy Master and Traitor, and then semicolon, Illuminati agent tour. Um, in this article, which I've recently posted on this website, and I would again invite your, your, your listeners to go to that article and uh, follow along, check it out. Uh, the research that I did for this article is kind of embarrassingly simple-minded. What I've done over the years is collect a lot of books and read them. Uh -huh. And... Uh, what uh, and this is of course what, when one does this, one realizes that a lot of books are very much on the level, and the researchers are genuinely interested in uncovering the truth, which sometimes can be hazardous to your health. Right. Um, I can talk about the ones that have been, I think, offed, uh, and and then there's a whole, you know, probably more books which are what we might call limited hangouts mm -hmm. that the CIA itself would have would have sponsored. Uh, or other uh, financial interests uh, to confuse, to poison the well, as it uh -huh. were. So we're always dealing with this, this difficult, challenging mix of information and disinformation. And that's how intelligence agencies maintain their power and control. Now, uh, just for kind of interest's sake, there's an interesting movie uh, called The Good Shepherd, uh, which I watched just a couple nights ago. Matt Damon plays a character very much like Alan Dulles, and it's very loosely uh, uh, patterned on his early life. But, of course, uh, again, there's so much that's not uh, true or not appropriate for Alan Dulles that one can't really 
get uh, a good sense of who Alan Dulles is, except kind of on a visceral, emotional level. One can. Um, and there's a great line in there. Uh, I, I don't have the quote right in front of me. It's somewhere in my on my website uh -huh. under the uh, the New World Religion question mark, in which uh, the senior British spy says to the junior American spy, more or less Alan Dulles, uh, you know, it's this. Uh, the black arts is what we in the in the you know the British aristocracy. This is our mother's milk, and this is how we control our empire. And the the way that we do this, and, and we hate to share it with you Americans, but we need your help in World War II, so we're going to have to share it with you. Right. And uh, and the way we do this, it's 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 manipulating the balance of information and disinformation. And uh, in in so doing, th therein lies power. Power is the ability to confuse, to um, give false perceptions, which of course our media does all the time, and our propaganda system. And many, many of our books, thanks to uh, CIA's Operation Mockingbird, uh, which goes way back to the 50s, in which they spent over a billion dollars uh, to uh, more or less control the, the storyline that uh, our press, our media was putting out. Alan Dulles himself, as we'll get into, had, had uh, tremendous contacts in the press, including the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, you know, he was, he was a famous <laughs> philanderer. He slept with a lot of the, uh, you know, the wives of, you know, like uh, Henry uh, Luce, uh, and uh, who was editor of Time magazine and who proclaimed the American century back in the 50s. And it was the Dulles brothers, really, who... who uh, who implemented this uh, American empire. Um, again, the one-two punch, John Foster Dulles, head of Secretary of State uh, under Eisenhower and Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. Uh, but going back to this information, disinformation interplay, this is all by way of introduction to our interview. Let me just read a smidge uh, from our friend, Dr. John Coleman, who's uh, MI6. Uh, that is to say, British intelligence, former British intelligence, and wrote a book on Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, shaping the moral, spiritual, cultural, political, and economic decline of, of the United States of America. Uh, he says, uh, in 2003, Bush the Younger followed very closely the formula that had, had succeeded for his father, but with some additional adaptations. News mixed with fiction became more fiction mixed with news. And blatant lying was resorted to so that straight reporting became impossible to distinguish from news adulterated with fiction. Um, he goes on, talks about, you know, the cooked intelligence from, that came, uh, you know, that justified the Iraq war in 2003. And then he talks about the, you know, the, the, uh, the scripted the incubator baby story that uh, Hill and Knowlton put together to help get us into the first Gulf War in 1991. Um, all this stuff, of course, is fabricated uh, um, lies, propaganda, uh, but it's very effective when the media gets a hold of these things and then keeps repeating it, and then the American people get sucked in. Um, um, and I'll just pick up a few paragraphs later. Later, a dire threat was added that Iraq had the capability to strike at the U.S. with long-range weapons of mass destruction. It was the adaptation of Stalin's edict that to capture and enslave your own people, first terrorize them. Well, uh, we see this through history, and certainly you and I grew up with the duck and cover. Yeah. Uh, we were kids, you know, and the, the nuclear threat was very real. I was in Washington, D.C. in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, you know all this uh, uh, was played out on the loudspeaker in my junior high school. And my classmates and I said, "Well, you know, goodbye. Yeah, you know, we're going to die." Yeah. And uh, this this was very kind of uh, you know pivotal and traumatic. And then of course the next year the Kennedy assassination, which as we'll see, Alan Dulles was probably the you know the the chairman of the board of the of the of Kennedy assassination, even though he had been fired by Kennedy in 1961 for the failed Bay of Pigs invasion into Cuba. Um, yeah. uh, in fact, I think the way it played out, and many will agree, is that uh, Alan Dulles kept, kept his post even though he'd been fired and was still manipulating the CIA. And a right. couple of years later, he fired John F. Kennedy in return 
uh, because Kennedy had made so many powerful enemies, and Dulles was always kind of a team player, so we'll get into that too. Yeah. But uh, uh, all this is by way of introduction, Paul. I'm sorry to be so wordy, but going no, back to don't. my article, which I, which I really would like people to consult, because there's no way to understand this stuff unless one reads widely. And uh, let me just pick up a couple. I've got all of this article comes from about 45 books that are on my shelf. And uh, I have figured out, I think, uh, I hope, <laughs> uh, the difference between the truth and propaganda when it comes to the story, main storyline of the 20th century. And of course, leading up to the present. And uh, I believe I've uh, judiciously chosen quotes from about 40, 45 books uh, that cool. in this article, direct quotes from these other authors who are researchers. I'm just the compiler here. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm a retired guy, 66. I was a physical right. geographer. I don't want to go out and do original research. I, I'm, you know, I, it's not what I'm into. But I am interested in the truth. Right. And uh, the, what I find is that each of these good books will contain nuggets of truth, but that you have to assemble them from a lot of different sources to get the big picture. Right. So that's what I've tried to do here. And I feel like coming to grips with, say, Alan Dulles's life story is a, is a very excellent way of understanding the power structure and how America has been co-opted uh -huh. uh, to become the American empire. Um, and, uh, of course, to fight all these foreign wars of aggression, to topple all these uh, nationalistic leaders that, tr after World War II, tried to share the resources of their country with their own people, such as Hakoba Arbenz, uh, which was, uh, he was removed from office uh, by a CIA coup in 1954. Um, he was just a, a nationalist reformer uh, who wanted to give a little bit of land to the poverty-stricken Guatemalans. I've been to Guatemala five times, and I have an affinity for those people. I like them. But the American ruling class just was happy as a clam to take out Hakobo right. Arbenz in a CIA orchestrated coup, put in Armas, who was a uh, American puppet, who initiated death squads, and uh, uh, you know, our, our Guatemala became a killing fields. Yeah. Uh, two or three hundred thousand peasants, uh, Guatemala peasants, were killed uh, in the police state, which American America set up in Guatemala to protect the interests of United Fruit Company, oh. which was uh, kind of one of the biggest of the corporations down there and had controlled uh, Guatemalan politics all along uh, so that it was a puppet. Well, guess who sat on the board of directors of uh, United Fruit? Well, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. So here you have two guys, and, and uh, okay, I'm, I'm kind of losing my thread. Uh, let, me, let me first of all go back to my, uh, uh, where I get the information. I'll just pick up a couple of the books, I, like I say, over 40. These are my sources, okay? Here is uh, Coburn and St. Clair. Uh, 1992, something like that. White out the CIA drugs and the press. Here is uh, William F. William Engdahl. I've got several of his books. Full spectrum dominance, totalitarian democracy in the new world order. Another one by Engdahl. Oil, Iraq, and the future of the dollars uh, is the subtitle. The title: Petrodollar warfare. No, excuse me. This is William Clark. Petrodollar warfare is the title. Oil, Iraq, and the future of the dollar. Here is uh, Christopher Simpson's The Splendid Blonde Beast, Money, Law, and, the Geno and Genocide in the 20th Century. Here is uh, our friend Carol Quigley, professor of political science at uh, Georgetown, who uh, wrote uh, this book's called The Anglo-American Establishment, and that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, likewise, uh, William Engdahl, A Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics and the New World Order, here is uh, William Blum, former State Department, Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions Since World War II. This this will kill your hope reading this book uh, wow. of, of how many countries and leaders the U.S. has destroyed. Now, Alan Dulles really set the tone, but obviously these policies have kept going to the present. It's called the American Empire. 
Uh, here's The Devil's Chessboard, a quite recent book last year by David Talbot, the subtitle, Alan Dulles, the CIA, and the Rise of America's Secret Government. Now, I've, I've actually got this on uh, audio tape, and I've been listening to it, and uh, I've read so much now, I can tell you when he's uh, concealing uh, information. Cool, cool. <laughs> so here's the exhaustive book on Alan Dulles, and in some ways, it's a limited hangout. He is, uh, he's telling you some information, and he's leaving things out. Right. Okay, so half a truth, it can be worse than a whole lie. So anyway, exactly. I, I'm interested in that, but I don't believe any of these books, so I triangulate with all of them to the extent that I can. Now, here's on IG Farben, the uh, uh, huge uh, conglomerate chemical corporation of uh, Germany that, that really backed Hitler financially, and it was all tied up with Rockefeller Standard Oil. So it was really Rockefeller, IG Farben, and of course the Dulles brothers were the lawyers for IG Farben and Rockefeller and Schroeder Bank in Germany and uh, uh, all of these interests. They were directors of all these major corporations as and Alan Dulles was the spy master and John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State that advanced the interest of these corporations. So we've had a corporate rule in America and Alan Dulles and uh, uh, and uh, John Foster Dulles were extremely effective um, uh, operatives for right. that uh, for that system. This book's called Hell's Cartel, I.G. Farben and the Making of Hitler's War Machine uh, by uh, Dyer Muid Jeffries. Now, these are just some of them, but I'll, yeah. I'll go through. Here's Inside I.G. Farben, Hecht During the Third Reich, Stefan H. Lindner, Okay, where's, here's our friend Daniel Estelin, Tavistock Institute, Social Engineering and the Masses. This is an important book and one of the few books that has actually been stolen from my library while I was out. <laughs> this one's called Secret Agenda, the United States Government, Nazi Scientists and Project Paperclip, 1945 to 1990 by Linda Hunt. Linda Hunt did a lot of good research on Operation Paperclip by which the Dulles brothers and others were able to smuggle out top Nazi uh, scientists right. and war criminals after World War II. And then they have infiltrated our scientific and medical establishments and uh, our government. Uh, this is an, a very important book that uh, costs about $100. It's, uh, you can get it. It's, uh, the New Underworld Order, Triumph of Criminalism, Dark Actors Playing Games, The Global Fantasies of the Geomasonic Illuminati. This is by a very, very well-educated fellow named Christopher Story, um, who's an uh, Englishman, well-educated, uh, and also an economic journalist. Uh, I believe he was probably poisoned in the United States in 2010. Um, uh, these are big, fat books, and I've read them. Right. <laughs> at, least, at least many of them. Uh, now, John Stockwell is the highest uh, CIA operative ever to go public. He was, uh, he was involved as an agent uh, station chief in Vietnam and also in uh, um, Uganda, I believe. Uh, or was it uh, the Congo? Yeah, the Congo. Um, of course, Patrice Lumumba was assassinated uh, by uh, the CIA under Alan Dulles, again, trying to share his resources in this country with his people as, as the Belgian, uh, Belgian uh, uh, colonialists were being kicked out after World War II. Well, the U.S., you know, would, would uh, make that. sure yeah, that, that, that the colonial system was maintained in, in actual fact and American hegemony, American empire, American interests, corporate interests would be sure. represented. It was which required that these nationalistic uh, leaders like Patrice Lumumba be assassinated or otherwise removed. And uh, John F. Kennedy didn't even know. See, this is how out of the loop presidents are. Right. Kennedy did not know that, that Alan Dulles and the CIA had assassinated Lumumba until two months or three months later. And this was just as soon as he got into power. So Alan Dulles was always uh, in charge under the Eisenhower administration. He even said, uh, Eisenhower has uh, surrendered his power to me. 
That's a direct quote from Alan, Alan Dulles. Dulles. Wow. Okay, so anyway, John Stockwell has uh, done some good writing. He's he was a very very high uh, CIA guy, and he's come out uh, saying that the Third World War in the in the in the uh, Third World uh, after World War II has killed over six million people, and this this is the wars of the secret wars of the CIA in effect. And again, John Stockwell. Uh, you can YouTube this guy. Many of the most of these guys you can get on YouTube or you can read their books. Uh, they have a wealth of good information. Jim Mars is pretty good. Uh, he gets into too much in the way of uh, Anna Nuki and spacemen for my taste. But he's got a good book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, The Secret Societies that Threaten to Take Over America. A lot of good information about the Nazis there. Uh, James Randall Noblet and Pamela Sue Perskin, Cult and Ritual Abuse, The History, Anthropology, and Recent Discovery in Contemporary America. Uh, that becomes important because MKUltra uh, and other mind control operations were really overseen and started by the CIA under Alan Dulles. And he, Alan Dulles, uh, tried to send, he did send his only, his, his namesake, his oldest son, to one of these CIA psychiatrists after he had, uh, uh, after this young man had returned from Korea with uh, the brain damage because he had uh, gotten some shrapnel in his skull, wounded, and uh, there's old Alan Dulles sending his own son off to uh, these monster psychiatrists. He also tried to send his wife Clover to uh, Ewan Campbell, uh, who was one of the really monster psychiatrists from Canada. Uh, who was uh, up in Toronto. You can read about all this stuff. Uh, Jim Keith was an excellent researcher. I think he may have been offed as well. Here's one of his many good books, uh, Mind Control and UFOs, Case Book on Alternative 3, uh, packed with information, as, as is uh, Mind Control, World Control by Jim Keith. <clears throat> this is a very important book uh, by Yaden and Hawkins. I think it's a Lulu book, which means you can get it printed. Um, but it's probably not in bookstores. The Nazi Hydra in America, Suppressed History of a Century. Good, big, fat book. <laughs> a lot of information there. Um, about Alan Dulles and his activities. Nice. And here's Mark Zipra-Zauer, The CIA's Greatest Hits. This is a very short book, easy to read, and very small um, representation of the CIA's hits. By the way, Stockwell um, and others referred to the uh, uh, church committee hearings in 1976 and 77, the Senate hearings, in which uh, it was revealed that the CIA at that time had conducted over uh, 10,000 uh, covert operations, every one of them illegal. And of course, of course 1977 to today is another 40 years almost. and. Uh, I'm sure they've done more than that. Uh, the complete here's uh, Acid Dreams, the complete social history of LSD, the CIA, the '60s and Beyond by Lee and Schlein. It's a well-researched book by Charles Hyam, the expose of the Nazi American money plot of 1933 to 1949, trading with the enemy. And this talks about how the Bush family, the Harriman family, the Rockefeller family. And of course, the Dulleses, as as prominent lawyers for Sullivan and Cromwell, which is Wall right. Street's premier legal firm for the robber barons, the Rockefellers, uh, uh, how they over 300 corporations in America were trading with Hitler uh, sure. when World War II broke out. Uh, so, in other words, the, the uh, uh, well, we'll get to the Hitler project and the and the German experiment soon because uh, Hitler and the Nazis were created by the Anglo-American establishment. Um, fascism there was uh, fueled by our eugenics uh, research by the Rockefellers, just like this same group created the Bolshevik Revolution. So you have this same group creating the, the monsters of communism in uh, Russia and China, which, you know, killed upwards of 200 million of their own people, if you add them together. And then they also created the Nazis, which is, of course, the right-wing version of uh, 
of uh, totalitarian government or top-down revolution, if you will, fascism, which has now come to the United States a big time. Uh, here's a book by Lincoln Lawrence. came out just a few years after Kennedy died. This is an excellent book uh, after the Kennedy assassination called Were We Controlled? The Assassination of Kennedy. And he talks about some of the mind, very sophisticated mind control uh, technologies that were used even back in 1963. Um, this is a pseudo name, Lincoln Lawrence. It was dangerous to write books like that at the time if you used your real name. Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness, Jim Keith. Again, he died too young. Uh, Terrorism and the Illuminati, 3,000-year uh, history by David Livingston. He's a, he's a um, Canadian uh, who's a Muslim, interestingly enough, and uh, uh, writes some very interesting things about uh, history. <clears throat> Blowback by Christopher Simpson, the first full account of America's recruitment of Nazis and its disastrous effect on our domestic and foreign policy. Here's an interesting one by uh, Guido Giacomo Preparata, Conjuring Hitler, How Britain and America Made the Third Reich. We'll see that that's the case. Um, Fletcher Prouty was in the CIA between 1955 and 1963. He wrote a book, uh, he's actually in the movie, JFK, uh, he, he, or his character is. Uh, it's called The Secret Team. Now, get this subtitle. The CIA and its allies in control of the United States and the world. <laughs> this is a guy who was in the CIA and knew Alan Dulles and knew these people. So that's what you call, you know, the real deal, I think. Uh, another one, Gangs of America, the Rise of Corporate Power and the Disabling of Democracy. One more I'll throw up there is okay. uh, Gang Stalking and Mind Control, the Destruction of Society Through Community Spying Networks, A.K. Forwood. If you want to know about gang stalking, you can print this sh short book up from Lulu, $10. And uh, this is, uh, again, the subtitle very revealing. The Destruction of Society Through Community Spying Networks. Well, all of this stuff comes from somewhere and Alan Dulles's life is a excellent place to start to understand where we are today again uh, Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster prominent lawyers with Sullivan and Cromwell the number one legal firm for the robber barons uh, now you look at the lives and this is uh, in my in my uh, article look at the lives of these guys uh, they were obviously born into, uh, well, before I do that, let me just get a couple quotes here, uh, if you'll forgive me. Uh, um, let me, let me, I showed you the book uh, by Yadin and, um, uh, and Hawkins uh, about uh, the Nazi Hydra in America. In that, it's just a provocative sentence. Direct actions taken by the Harriman Bush shipping line in 1932, this is, of course, between World War I and World War II, and by the Dulles brothers in January 1933, are the two gravest and most treasonous actions ever taken against the United States and humanity in the 20th century. Those actions led, led directly to the seizure of power by the Nazis, placing the burden for World War II squarely on the shoulders of Harriman, Bush, and the Dulles brothers. Unequivocally, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, Prescott Bush, and Averill Harriman were the most flagrant in providing aid for the Nazis. Not only did they help Hitler seize power, their actions also facilitated other American aid to the Nazis. Bush and Harriman acted as Hitler's American banker, operating a company Brown Brothers, Harriman, and Union Banking Company that was the center of the Nazis' espionage ring in the United States. The Nazis were spying on us before World War II, and the Nazis being a creation of the Anglo-American Alliance, or the elite, anyway. Sure. Once, once it uh, was clear that the war was imminent, the Dulles Brothers attempted to hide, to cloak the Nazi investments uh, of their clients. So 70% of the investments from Wall Street between World War I and World War II were in the Nazi-German war machine in order to, to, to concoct World War II. Once it was clear that the war uh, was imminent, the Dulles brothers attempted to cloak 
Now these guys are financial wizards. They're 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 hiding all these deals. Mm-hmm. They're clever at that. And and of course, one guy in becomes Secretary of State, and one guy becomes head of the CIA, then they can really make it stick. Uh, this is from Glenn Yadin and John Hawkins, 2007, The Nazi Hydra in America, Suppressed History of a Century. Um, here's from James Jesus Angleton, the CIA chief of counterintelligence, who was the guy who was the liaison to the Vatican, and who was the main liaison to the Mossad, the CIA-trained Mossad. Uh, he said, Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, Carmel Offey, and Frank Wisner were the grand masters. If you were in a room with them, you were in a room full of people that you had to believe would deservedly end up in hell. I guess I will see them there soon. <laughs> well, a little candor, uh, uh, but uh, um, here's, uh, here's what Fletcher Prouty said, uh, the, the guy who worked in the CIA and wrote The Secret Team. The CIA and its allies in control of the United States and the world. The CIA's control of security within this country, even more than elsewhere, is nearly absolute. Of course, what follows from this is the ability to make and to control the foreign policy and military policy making machinery of this country. And then you have another ex CIA guy. Uh, No, this is from Michael Collins Piper's book, Final Judgment, The Missing Link in the JFK Assassination Conspiracy. Uh, I'm convinced that John Kennedy was assassinated largely by Alan Dulles, whom he, no, sorry, this is not by uh, Michael Collins Piper. This is by um, an ex-CIA guy whose name will come to me in a second. Uh, He said this recently in in an interview. I'm convinced that John Kennedy was assassinated largely by Alan Dulles, whom he cashiered, fired, as the head of the CIA after the Bay of Pigs, and a coterie of Joint Chiefs of Staff, FBI, and even some Secret Service folks. This is by retired CIA analyst Ray McGovern in 2013 on a radio interview, WBAI Law and Order. And then Michael Collins Piper, in his final judgment book, said, uh, 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 Israel's global network had the power to orchestrate not only the assassination of Kennedy, but also the subsequent cover-up. Israel was indeed a key player in the JFK assassination conspiracy, and the evidence suggests the primary instigator of the crime. So, uh, oh, and then another great quote, treason doth never prosper. What's the reason? Why? If it prosper, none dare call it treason. <laughs> that's a good, well, that's, good way to that's look at good, it. That's by Sir John Harrington, Epigrams, Book 4, Epigram 5. Um, so this guy, Alan Dulles, uh, he and his brother were born to a very, uh, you know, he is not a rich family, but very well-connected family. His uncle, I think two of his, uh, his uncle and father-in-law were Secretary of State. Um, and uh, if uh, the first part of this thing, I talk about the family history here. Uh, so they're, they're connected to the, the global elite with their, uh, their cousins and in-laws with the Rockefellers. Uh, they're intermarried with these uh, spy master families from Switzerland, uh, and uh, they were nephews of the Secretary of State Robert Lansing. Uh, the, one of their relatives supposedly brought Scottish Rite of Freemasonry to the United States, and they were strong supporters of eugenics and mind control movements and programs all along. So uh, they were they were tapped very relatively young age. Uh, to be actual co-founders of the Council on Foreign Relations right after World War II. So there they are with Colonel Edward Mandel House, who was the Rothschild agent, who was controlling, like a puppet master, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, and getting us into World War I, and getting us the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. In other words, he was a one-worlder. Yeah. Uh, Edward Mandel House is one of these Illuminati agent tour that uh, has enormous uh, impact on on history. He's not elected ever. He's an advisor. Yeah. And he seems to have some kind of mental uh, hold. This is where maybe the spiritual end end comes in. He seems to have a mental hold over President Woodrow Wilson. And uh, he actually had an office in in the White House. And again, Illuminati uh, Rothschild agent from the south 
Uh, and uh, he was also at that meeting in which the Council on Foreign Relations was formed. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations formed in 1921 as an American adjunct of the British um, Royal Institute for International Affairs, right. which came out of the Cecil Rhodes uh, Roundtable Group, the Milner Group, mm -hmm. the One Worlder Group that wanted to, again, implement one world uh, government under British control. And uh, so, uh, again, it's fairly small cabal of individuals who have right. enormous power through their network, uh, their secret societies, right. and their financial clout. Um, and uh, so there were the Dulles brothers, young, taking up the mantle of Colonel Edward House, who was retiring at that time, I guess, from being on the world stage as an agent tour. Uh, and then uh, the young Dulles brothers, both lawyers, uh, and the older at this time associated with Sullivan and Cromwell, they're at the Paris Peace Conference. And they right. helped craft the Versailles Treaty, which had terms of reparation that were so harsh on Germany that it more or less guaranteed World War II. Right. So these guys were setting up World War II even as World War I closed. Right. And uh, there's a banker out of London, city of London, named Tiarx, who actually used the term the German experiment. And yeah. there are others who talk about the Hitler project. So the Hitler project, the German experiment, the creation of this fascist occult, it's a death cult, really, right. because it's... It's got the OTO in it. It's got right. the Helen Blavatsky Theosophy. It's got uh, the Vril Society. It's got the Tool Society. All these satanic uh, influences satanic. are integrated into Hitler and his top team. And, uh, of course, the Dulles brothers, uh, again, law uh, were lawyers. But Alan Dulles, in particular, even... Between the wars, he was in the State Department, and he was stationed in Bern, Switzerland, where he had developed all these contacts and networks with Germans. In fact, uh, Christopher Story, who wrote the New Underworld Order, uh, says uh, Dulles was always a uh, German Abwehr agent. Yeah. In other words, he was always a spy. He was always a double, triple, quadruple agent. Right. Not only for Britain, he was MI6. But he was also a spy with with the Germans, and he was a spy with and for eventually, uh, as uh, with his cooperation with exactly. with Israel's Mossad. So here's a guy whose whose allegiances are really are to no country, but to the bankers whom he served as as in the capacity of lawyer right. and spy. And uh, I think so, uh, I think we should mention how this cabal set up World War II. And right. uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me so the Paris, uh, the Versailles Treaty totally crippled and made uh, Germany non-functional. It disarmed the people and made and put them so much in debt that they could no longer function. Then Alan Dulles and the boys come in with all this money and bankroll Hitler and to create IG Farman, which is Hitler, according to. Uh, Anthony Sutton. So it's like they created the chaos, then they then they created the order for for the other. You know, you have to have two sides in a war, so you have to you have to have, exactly. make sure they have guns and stuff. Absolutely, and you've got it. Uh, the, you know, these these are techniques I think of manipulating countries, manipulating people. Um, Obviously, this has happened in Britain. You know, this was a pretty Christian country. The Magna Carta comes from from Britain. From Britain, yeah. Uh, you know, in the in the 11th century, I believe. Uh, so there's this kind of Christian impulse, which gets taken over, you know, in the 16, 1700s as the Bank of England comes in, and and that's of course controlled by the Rothschild family. Um, the, Germany also was a stalwart country, really. Uh, uh, I think in a lot of ways, the people were. Um, very industrious, still are, and still are. Uh, 
Britain wanted to take down that potential threat, and that was one way to do it, was to pit Germany against the Soviet Union. And, and the great game, you know, from the British point of view, Halford Mackinder, this geographer, geopolitician uh, in Britain, uh, always talked about how the real war was between Britain and Russia for control of Eurasia, which has two-thirds of the world's population yeah. and two-thirds of the world's resources. So uh, all of this then is manipulation of countries by, you know, the power elite so that uh, they control the resources and they take out their enemies. They First they create and then they take out And they out take them enemies. out, yeah. Yeah, so Hitler, the Germans <sighs> were, were victim of this uh, system twice, World War One and World War Two. So you almost feel sorry for, you do feel sorry for right. the rank and file Germans. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the Nazi party, it's hard to feel sorry for those guys. Well, right. then Alan Dulles, of course, has all these contacts with uh, Switzerland and Austria and, and Germany uh, going into World War II, and he's a spy over there during World War II. He is, uh, um, at that time, you know, he becomes a member of the young OSS, which is the, the precursor to the CIA. And uh, so the Rockefellers would have had all these financial arrangements with IG Farben and the Schroeder Bank, and uh, all these German cartels, as well as British, and uh, uh, Alan Dulles, ob obviously very clever fellow, <laughs> yeah, obviously very smart, uh, obviously very charming, uh, yeah, obviously very determined. Demo uh, he, Demo I could say demonically possessed too, knowing that he's bloodline and belongs to I, all I these secrets. I think that's probably an accurate um, observation. Um, the people that have profiled him, like uh, Talbot in his book about the, the Devil's Just War, uh, you know, they say he's a psychopath, you know. Yeah. And a uh, psychopath doesn't, doesn't feel guilt or doesn't have a conscience. No. And uh, he said he would brag that he was probably the only person in Washington that could knowingly send somebody to their death. And, of course, he did uh -huh. uh, on a regular basis. Kennedy. He had... Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> the president of the United yeah, States. Yeah, that's others, right. Others. And then he would, you know, sleep with all kinds of other, you know, attractive spies in Europe. And some of them would get wrong sided with, the, you know, the CIA. And he just let them get, get, get off. You know? Off, yeah. It's no big deal, you know, because it's, it's always this, uh, this uh, milking everybody for any tidbit of information that could help the grand spy master, you know, orchestrate things. Right. So, so Hitler uh, is set up by what I'll call the Rockefeller, Harriman, Bush, Dulles faction. And we have to see Alan Dulles as a very, uh, very clever uh, representative of this corporate world uh, that sets up Hitler. And right after, and of course, during World War II, uh, FDR, Roosevelt, um, wanted Germany to completely surrender unconditionally after World War II. Uh, Alan Dulles, meanwhile, sets up a separate piece in Italy called Operation Sunrise, in which he gets with one of the Nazis named Karl Wolf, and they, uh, they set up a, a separate set of uh, kind of uh, terms of the surrender, which actually leave the Nazis with a lot of power. It allows the Nazis to escape you know, through the rat lines on Operation Paperclip to South America and the Americas yes. and, and take a lot of their money with them. Yeah. And, and, and these business arrangements then are maintained by Dulles and his clients with guys like Martin Borman, yeah. the number two man at, uh, and, and, and so after World War II, you have the Nazi Internationale operating globally now uh, with, again, contacts to American corporate interests uh, again, courtesy of Alan Dulles and his uh, networks. Mm -hmm. So here is a guy, this Alan Dulles, who helped set up World War II, uh, of, course, of course, killed about 60 or 70 million people, and, uh, of course, devastated the United States, as, even though the United States came out uh, as number one wealthiest country after World War II. Um, 
And uh, then he maintained his spy network with uh, Britain and the Nazis after World War II. And then it was really the Dulles brothers and Re Reinhard Galen, who was the top spy master, the German spy master on the Eastern Front, that is, of the Soviets. Ga the Galen organization was subsumed into the new CIA right from the start. So wow. uh, our CIA was always a mixture of ex-Nazis and American Ivy Leaguers, Princeton, Yale, yeah. Harvard graduates, smart people, often intellectual and liberal, uh, who tended to be selected by the CIA. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, uh, Fletcher Prouty has some very interesting comments. Again, Fletcher Prouty, the ex-CIA guy himself, who said that, uh, you know, there is a legitimate function in a government to collecting information and intelligence. And, of course, that's what was sold to President Truman uh, when he passed the National Security Act in 1947. But Truman was very cautious and leery of a, of a runaway covert organization that would do all these illegal covert ops. So he wanted to hold them to the fire. At least that's the story. But guys like Dulles, they really got, they got turned on by the covert ops. That's what, you know, that's what made them sure. really happy. And uh, so Prouty says, actually, if Dulles has his way, which, of course, he did, uh, the, the, the ratio of covert ops, you know, taking down foreign leaders, insurrections, coups, things like that, to intelligence gathering would be about 90% covert ops and 10% intelligence gathering, whereas mm -hmm. Prouty says it should be the other way around. Uh, it, it should be mostly intel intelligence gathering, you know, and I, the covert ops, again, are illegal, um, extra legal. They've always been extra legal. They're illegal any, anywhere. And the CIA's charter said it couldn't operate in the United States. Well, it's been operating in the United States yeah. ever since it was formed, right. illegally. Right. And uh, our, our generation was spied on in Operation Chaos in, uh, you know, during the 60s because they yeah. wanted to see kind of a playback thing how their how their operations, like uh, Laurel Canyon, all the hippie counterculture, right. how that was disempowering the anti-Vietnam War protests. Well, to go to go back to the Vietnam War, which was so pivotal and devastating um, in our generation, in my generation, it was a CIA operation from the beginning, uh, starting in about 1952 uh, with Ed, Edward Lansdale going over there. Obviously, the French were being kicked out by the Vietnamese, and it was a colonial situation. The United States, again, wanted to move in to be the new uh, master of the third world country and its resources. Uh, they, again, used the anti-communism excuse. Oh, they're, you know, sure. and of course, uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh was always writing letters to our president, quoting you know, our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, saying, hey, we want to do that here. Will right. you be our friends, you know? Right. We want you to be our friend. And uh, he had been educated in France. You know, he, he knew something about Marxism, but basically he just wanted to be a nationalist and share the resources of his country with his people, like Mossadegh did right. in Iran and like our bands did in Guatemala. You go down the list of all these countries that were destabilized and destroyed and kept in their poverty to be... Uh, you know, a resource for the American empire. Yeah. And uh, anyway, going back to Vietnam, it wasn't until 1964 that the U.S. Army and other military forces uh, actually uh, sent people over there. Between 52 and 64, it was always a secret covert operation by the CIA. And mm -hmm. part of that included taking over the drug trade, which, of course, the French had... Uh, the French Connection, Marseille, right. and then that was over towards, uh, you know, the Golden Triangle and the heroin and the opium out of Laos. So the American establishment uh, and the British establishment were the same ones, the British East India Company, that they've got a foothold in China through the opium wars by getting a country to 
to be uh, addicted to drugs and then they could come in and steal the resources. Well, they, they applied that same technique to our country in the 60s. Right. After, after the CIA had <clears throat> done all these experiments on LSD and found out that it was a, a psychosis producing weapon of war. Right. And they tested all of these drugs and CIA, they, they really kind of liked that. Richard Helms was the guy who took, took the lead on that, as well as Sidney Gottlieb of the Technical Services Division. Uh, these are the MK Ultra guys. Um, the mind control guys, these are the real dark, dark psychopaths, uh, because when you start playing with people's minds, you, you actually destroy them, I think, and you take away their so. soul to, to a large extent. Uh, this, they did this uh, wholesale, and they were using Americans as guinea pigs uh, throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and right probably to the present. Right. Um, so we're talking, you know, very satanic. This is mind control is satanic. There's no question. No about doubt it. about it. And the CIA took the, uh, the experiments that the Nazis were doing uh, under Joseph Mengele and other eugenicists and mind control monsters, um, and the CIA kept them going under MK Ultra, often bringing the same German psychopath doctors yeah. into this country. The same guys, uh, Joseph Mengele, were programming American youth. This is top, top secret stuff. Right. But now it's coming out. Um, so all of this was happening under Alan Dulles, too. It was April 1953. He had just, he started in 1953, that uh, Dulles uh, authorized MK Ultra. This was top, top, top secret. Uh, and then in 1953, on the covert side, uh, Kermit Roosevelt, uh, who was actually related to Teddy Roosevelt, right. orchestrated this coup in Iran uh, in which uh, the newly elected nationalistic uh, president uh, of Iran, uh, Mossadegh, was ousted by a very, very uh, dirty uh, CIA campaign. Um, and, of course, this was at the behest of the British because Anglo-American oil, which became British Petroleum later, uh, had uh, a lock on the profits from all the oil out of Iran. And then when Mossadegh came in, he wanted to nationalize the oil and uh. make some of the money for the people of Iran. And this was intolerable to the British, <laughs> so they, they wanted to take him down. Well, after World War II, they had lost the, the sufficient clout to be able to be to do that. And Mossadegh actually closed the British embassy. So then the British said, well, hey, will you help us out, Alan? And, yeah. uh, and so then Dulles uh, took over that operation. It called Operation Ajax. And uh, this is his first year as CIA director. But of course, he'd been a spy for decades. Sure. And uh, Kermit Roosevelt was the guy who was given enough CIA cash and did the dirty tricks. Uh, to actually orchestrate this coup, which ousted Mossadegh. They took him out, they took him down, and they reestablished the tyrannical rule of the Shah, mm -hmm. who is this very uh, weak, uh, even Roosevelt said he's, he's a real wimp. And, of course, that's perfect for the American uh, empire because right. he can be completely controlled. And then it was the CIA and the Mossad that trained his death squad uh, security system, the SAVAK, sure. which operated for the next 25 years in, in a completely totalitarian manner, but that kept the oil flowing, yeah. the profits going. See, after, after the CIA coup, now Standard Oil and the American oil companies were getting a 40% piece of the profits, whereas before it was all going to England. So, so that was, you know, this was, this was just the greatest thing that ever happened. Yeah. To, uh, you know, this was really what turned on Dulles. He said the highlight of his career uh, as in the CIA was, was the uh, Operation Ajax, the, the coup in Iran that took out democratically elected Mossadegh, and Operation PB Success the next year in 1954, which took out uh, Hakobar, Hakobo Arbenz. Identical situation, a nationalist uh, trying to share the wealth of the country with his own people. That was completely intolerable. Can't do that. And and again, both situations followed by uh, repressive dictatorships that are puppets to the American uh, 
corporate interests and resulted in widespread suffering of the people sure. and impoverishment of the people so that even a few years ago if you know if you want to if you're a Guatemalan peasant say a Mayan descendant and your family might make three dollars a day all of you right. man and woman and six kids picking coffee beans three dollars a day because that's the minimum wage in Guatemala but they weren't getting their work because in Vietnam it was a dollar a day for right. the whole family. so this is the end result of the American uh, uh, Empire from the point of view of labor in fact I started to see it very much like uh, the Civil War and slavery because before the Civil War the southern slave owners had to take care of the slaves right after the Civil War, they let the slaves go, and now those poor people have to take care of themselves. Right. That's a better deal for the corporate masters. Well, a little bit the same thing happened when, when World War II happened. The British Empire was splintered. The British Empire, you know, in India and all their commonwealth countries, uh, actually had to kind of uh, oversee and, and monitor and administrate in those countries. Well, after World War II, that system officially was torn up, but a new system was implemented in which those people in those countries were still subjugated. In fact, even worse. But now the, the uh, overseeing of those countries was going to be done by uh, tin, tin horn dictators right. in those countries answerable to the American establishment. <clears throat> and then their policies were going to be uh, their economic policy is going to be dictated by the World Bank and the International yep, Monetary yep, Fund. Yep. And if they wanted, such as Ecuador, if they wanted to, uh, you know, get loans, or then they had to follow these structural adjustment programs, the Washington Consensus, which is sometimes called the neoliberal reform. Right. So this is the soft end of totalitarian uh, right. rule. You can... Go ahead, the you... hard end is the neoconservatives, new conservatives, which is actually we're going to invade your country and destroy it. Right. So two ways to destroy your country, neoliberalism and neoconservatism, uh, new liberalism, new conservatism, which both implement the policies of, of the Wall Street elite. Yeah, yeah, what are you going right. to say? Oh, I was just going to say, I can see why uh, Kermit Roosevelt, just that coup totally delighted Alan Dulles, because that was a model. You can go right. in, you can... Uh, caused so much consternation and what what he did is he turned the people against him and uh, they overthrew and, and Alan Dulles is now looking at a at a process that he can just shoot his agents in that's why it's 90 percent covert operations you know they can control these things now they've gotten really sloppy they just go in and they you know like they did in, in Ukraine they just totally, they overthrow it. They don't even care whether it's a popular uprising or anything. But I can see, you can see how it changed right after the, uh, the Shah of Iran was put in. Yes, and uh, one tidbit I did get out of uh, uh, Talbot's book about the Devil's Chessboard. While uh, Alan Dulles is doing all these coups and insurrections and uh, assassinations in third world countries to make those countries safe for American corporations. Meanwhile, his brother, John Foster, I I head of the State Department, is threatening countries around the world with nuclear war. We've got the bomb and you don't. And right. you play with us or, so again, this is terrorism two ways. Uh, mm -hmm. We are imposing terror on the world with our technological superiority. And Dulles and Eisenhower you know, they talked about uh, using the nuclear bomb uh, fairly regularly. And Lyman Lemnitzer, the guy who wanted to, who was head of chiefs of staff um, uh, during the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, these guys were wanting to, to go for a nuclear conflict with Russia. They were pushing for it. And Kennedy, of course, pushed back and said, right. no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and uh, so this thread of, you know, this warmongering. Now, now the, look at it from the corporate side. In the Cold War, where we, we propped up the Soviet Union to be the enemy. Right. And then, we, and then the German Galen organization and the Dulles team was always feeding false uh, intelligence 
to the American president saying that this, you know, enormous uh, enemy over there uh, is ahead of us in this and that, so we have to spend more on, you know, more nuclear weapons, et cetera. Uh, according to the statistics I've heard, uh, $9 trillion were uh, spent in the Cold War, post-World War II, Cold War period on military industrial defense contracts. Right. Now that is $9 trillion at that time was more than all other sectors of the American economy. Okay, so, uh, and this is federal money, tax money going yep. to these corporations. So you see that the effect for Sullivan and Cromwell's clients, right. uh, the military industrial complex, was very beneficial. This Cold War uh, allowed Russia to penetrate and, and control its satellite countries uh, in the communist uh, second world. Right. We penetrated and controlled our de facto colonies in the first world. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, they were in the third world, but we had control of them through our coups, et cetera, and our assassinations. So we had a bipolar world in which there was this supposedly nuclear standoff, mutually assured destruction, yeah. crackpot realism that these, these rational people in the CIA who have PhDs from the best universities are talking, well, you know, if they do this, we're just going to have to, you know, we're going to have to blow them up with nuclear weapons. And, and of course, the idea is that, is that this is going to be so unacceptable, you know, the other team's going to back down because the the casualties and of course right. think about it uh, soviet union russia had lost you know upwards of 20 million or more in world war ii they didn't want to lose the rest of their population right so they were always backing down from american threats including uh, and of course kennedy then uh, back down in the cuban missile crisis uh, made a deal with khrushchev which enraged the uh, cia and the corporate powers that be and lyman lemnitzer and those guys and uh, that's when Alan Dulles was fired by Kennedy. Now, the, the subtext, if you, if you watch the movie, uh, The Good Shepherd, is uh, that uh, this character loosely based on uh, Alan Dulles, who's uh, played by Matt Damon, uh, that it's his son uh, who is uh, wanting to please his dad, who divulges the word Bay of Pigs to an enemy operative, and that's why they're able to, you know, defeat the American CIA invasion in 1961 at the Bay of Pigs. Well, that, of course, is fantasy. That's fiction. Uh, the, the story that comes out from reading all these books, to me anyway, is that the CIA put their third team in charge of this invasion so that it would fail, and then Kennedy would have to come in with American firepower, in other words, the whole military, right. to protect this, this operation. In other words, to lure him into a war with Cuba so that the rich mafioso, uh, Meyer Lansky and whatnot, would be able to take back their little island where they could have, right. you know, all their whorehouses and, and, uh, and strip joints and, and uh, casinos in Havana again, you know. So uh, it didn't work. Uh, Kennedy uh, was very strong in some ways, much stronger than he was supposed to be, and very smart. Yeah, and he outraged uh, the power elite, and eventually, of course, they they took him out, took him out publicly, yeah. very publicly, and uh, you know whether it's uh, you know so Piper says it's the Mossad that led it. A lot of people say it's the CIA that led it. Some people say the mafia led it. Obviously, it was a mix of all kinds of interests, yeah. including corporate interests that ultimately backed it. Uh, you know, was the shooter shooter team. Uh, the JM Wave team that uh, Dulles had set up uh, to assassinate leaders uh, that was located in Miami that in fact took out foreign leaders? Or was it uh, a bunch of Corsicans that, uh, that the Mossad controlled? Well, you know, it's going to be hard to, f we still don't know <laughs> for right. sure after all these years, but uh, it was obviously a, a, a hit. And, uh, and again, Alan Dulles, according to Talbot's book, even though he was kicked out in 1961, he had so many contacts. And yeah. he was at that weekend, he was actually in the, the main CIA bunker, which was outside of Langley in a place called The Farm. So all weekend long, while Kennedy's getting assassinated and then Ruby's getting assassinating yeah. Oswald, he's he's 
in control, just like Cheney was in right. the bunker during 9-1-1. So these guys, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the elite against America. Right. And it's the elite against the world uh, for control of everything, as right. far as I can tell. And Alan Dulles is uh, just the uh, most fascinating character. He died in 1969. Uh, there's interesting stories about uh, his death, uh, but I don't, uh, it's kind of a little sordid. Um, these guys who are, tend to be used by uh, Satan send, tend, to, <laughs> tend to die very, very, in a very ugly manner. Uh, right. And uh, Frank Wisner was head of covert ops. He was absolutely stark raving mad when he died. Uh, likewise, James Forrestal, secretary of the Navy or something like that, very powerful. He was he was totally bonkers when he died. I mean, their 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 life karma, if you will, right? You know, is so is so overwhelming towards the end of their lives that it's it's a total disaster. Uh, the story on Dulles, I guess I'll tell it. Tex Mars tells the story. Uh, there was a big party at uh, the the uh, home of Alan and Clover Dulles. Clover, his long-suffering wife, and he had, a, you know, hundreds and thousands of, you know, liaisons with, with other women, and he'd write home to her about it, and uh, this is all detailed in, in Talbot's book, or at least some of it is, and, uh, but interestingly, I don't think Talbot tells this story, uh, again, limited hangout, but uh, uh, he was failing, he was upstairs in bed, uh, Clover has a big party with all the, Illum you know, the Illuminati, the right. Glitterati, the, uh, the power players in 1969 in the D.C. area in Georgetown, and uh, Clover is in a very upbeat mood, looks really, you know, well-dressed and, you know, wonderful hostess, and people keep Alan asking about Alan, oh, he's got the flu, he's upstairs, don't worry, you know, he'll be all right. Well, some of Alan's friends go upstairs to say hello, and they see that he's rolling around in his own, you know, pee and feces, yeah. um, mumbling. You know, he's losing his mind. Uh, his wife is so disgusted with him, she won't even, you know, change the bed clothes. Right. And uh, then one of his uh, employees, uh, who actually must have liked him, said, okay, this is, this is not good. We're going to bring him to the hospital. Right. So they, 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 you know, they wrapped him up in a bunch of bed clothing, brought him to the hospital where he died a few months later. But, uh, you know, I mean, can you imagine uh, the humiliation that he must have put her through? Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, well, yeah, you, they, to, to imagine the type of society that they live in, the type of parties that they have, the type of associates, I mean, it would be a real stretch for any of us normal people to even put the, I mean, uh, eyes wide shut is the thing that I always think of when I think of the elite parties. Because, you know, they're 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 uh, ritual sessions too. You know, it's not just not just fun and games and sex, which is, I guess a lot of it is. Well, if I could comment on that, Paul. Yeah, I'd like I it. I think I think there's an intermediate level. I think that the eyes wide shut thing is really yes for the elite, and that's the that's the real dark secret side. I think there is a kind of a public side that has to do with these parties in which you don't see that. You don't right. see the masks, you don't see the rituals, but there is an awful lot of, uh, you know, hobnobbing and charming. Supposing, supposedly, Alan Dulles was very, you know, engaging and charming. Um, and uh, yes, it, it would be hard for us to imagine it, but actually not so hard for me, because I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, I, uh, you know, there's some connections in my life to, to this world. Um, I won't go into it, but uh, it's a very sophisticated, um, um, actually fun, you know, these people are, you know, witty, gay, having fun, and, uh, you know, great parties, and, and uh, so I think Alan Dulles was, uh, you know, it, this comes across very well in the movie, The Good Shepherd, where they, where they show these gatherings of the skull and bones you know i mean the bushes are from skull and bones yeah. and yes these are satanic societies but they have their parties uh and it's it's what? all very sweet this? or apparently sweet you know they get the minister up there you know praying for the interests of the people involved and 
And it's there is a level of in at which these guys are the good guys, and uh, they're doing good in the world. Well, and you have to go a little deeper to find out that you know this is just not true. I mean, what they're doing in the world is is extremely destructive. But they they are protecting their own, and uh, I guess they they can rationalize it that way. I I think that's real important. It's important for me to know about that. That there's this other this uh, what social level, where they hobnob with one another, and there might be people outside of the cult involved in this. Correct. Yes. Yes, uh, and it's hard to know exactly who's involved in the cult, but the cult has its has its tentacles out. Right. And I think Anthony Sutton is real good on this in his book on Skull and Bones. He, he, he kind of draws concentric rings like an onion. Uh -huh. And each of these organizations is, is like that with an inner core and then circles outside, like the Council on Foreign Relations, let's say. You've got your inner core, 6,000 people. The, the inner core might be 30. Right. And then you've got your outer core, which are very highly respectable, um, successful uh, representatives in academics and in uh, the media and in, in you know corporate right. world. And they don't really know everything that's going on in the inner circle. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think that this is the structure of a lot of these organizations so that, uh, you know, not everybody in the CIA is bad. Right. But... At some point, you know, they're going to perhaps, if they have a career in it, they're going to get wind of activities. Right. And at some point, they're going to make a decision, wow, that's, uh, you know, that's awful. Uh, you know, we killed Kennedy. Right. <laughs> that's bad. But <clears throat> hey, I've got so much invested in this career and my retirement and my family, right. blah, 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 that I'm not going to blow the whistle on it. And if I did, they would come after me, you know. So you have these various levels of being compromised right. by this system. So you could, where does the cult start and end? Well, you know, the people that are compromised uh, can't talk about it. Right, right. So that's, that's what I see. I mean, like the Manhattan Project was secret, you know, with 30,000 people. But that was, uh, you know, to make the nuclear bomb during World War II. Top secret, 30,000 people sworn to secrecy. Nobody told anything. It was secret. Likewise, the, the mind control stuff was the Manhattan Project of, of mind control. But the, but, that, the, but the Manhattan Project was a brainchild that was hatched at Bohemian Grove. So the, so the core, what you're saying is the core of these people, they were certainly insiders, certainly eyes wide shut kind of guys. But... They controlled. Uh, they probably controlled another level through uh, information blackmail career, and then outside of that, there's the people like you and I. You know, I've worked for these huge corporations as a consultant, and I certainly had no idea, you know, the bottom line where they were going with this stuff. I was totally compartmentalized. So that's a very good point. A, a, the CIA is extremely compartmentalized. Yeah. So one could have a career in the CIA doing. Uh, X, you know, liaison to, uh, you know, country Y, uh, talking about uh, foreign exchange, for instance. Right. You know, money's at the heart of this thing. Yeah. You know, these corporate lawyers that are always in control, or, or, or bankers, that right. are always in control of the CIA, and they themselves will have all their slush funds and their corporate connections, like the BCCI Bank, you know, Nugent Hand, uh, all of these, and of course the Iran Contra, and all these networks into the crime, crime world uh, right from the get-go. I mean, the, the, this, as soon as the CIA was formed, uh, the CIA was toppling uh, governments in Italy, yeah. in Greece, 48, 49, that's like before CIA was formed, they were doing that. The OSS was doing that. And uh, uh, the Operation Gladio, which was a CIA thing, the P2 Lodge out of Italy, the, the you know the uh, Lucio Gelli and and all these you know all these connections with the Vatican. I mean the 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 connections run so deep across the power spectrum, and yet you have to try to find out where the core is. And I think the the great thing about this particular 
you know, line of inquiry into the life of Alan Dulles is you can see where the core is, or at least you can see where some of the most powerful operatives are. Uh, you know, if, if you've traced it to the Rockefeller, Harriman, Bush, Dulles faction, which we do uh, in, this, in this article, well, there might be a deeper level, but not a whole lot deeper. Rothschild, for sure. I mean, over and right. over and over. Uh, but <clears throat> is it, does it go deeper than that? Uh, well, maybe powers and principalities, you know. Right. The Illuminati families, the DuPonts, uh, yeah. the, 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 uh, the Krupps in Germany. Um, this may be the core of it, you know. I remember um, reading about the Committee of 300, and then there are certain people in the Committee of 300, like... Maybe maybe Kissinger, maybe H.W. Uh, Bush, and they called themselves. Get this, they're grown-up adults. They call themselves the Olympians. Right. So they they I think were in charge of the Committee of Three Hundred. Now who goes back behind those people? There certainly is another level, but it's behind the curtain. Well, the black nobility for sure. Yeah. The the the, the House of Royals in Britain for sure. Um, and the, the Vatican Rochelle, for sure. Vatican. What do you the think? The Vatican is is the Vatican is totally and they get back to this analogy of the of the concentric circles. I mean the Vatican is can be very dark, but your average Catholic out here can be a very sweet person. Right. So in a sense they're 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 kind of part of a cult network and they don't even know it, you know. Right. Um, and they support that cult network with their tithes or with their contributions and they don't know it. That's so right. I think maybe that's a good analogy for a way a lot of these systems work. Right. There's there's off, often a lot of us who are trying to uh, push back in the New World Order, say, well, there's so many of us and so few of them. Well, that depends on how you look at it. Uh, that they, they control a whole, they, they aren't a lot of people, but they control a lot of people. I think if that's... Absolutely. Well, you know, again, going back to some of the interesting quotes, um, let me give you one on that topic. Uh, this is in my, I always have some frontest quotes in my articles. And this one happens to be by Lieutenant Colonel Roberts uh, before a joint committee of the Wisconsin State Legislature. He said, the most secret knowledge, a science which outdates history, is the science of control over people, governments, and civilizations. Jeez. The foundation of this ultimate discipline is the control of wealth. <laughs> Who controls wealth? The Rothschild. Right. Uh, through the control of wealth comes the control of public information and the necessities of life. Through the control of news media comes thought control. Through the control of basic necessities comes direct control of the people. A significant portion of the American public is yet to become aware of the invisible, invisible government of monetary power. Wow. Who, who did that? What quote? Lieutenant, is... Lieutenant Colonel Roberts uh, in front of the Wisconsin State Legislature. Um, wow. You know, so the, the, the truth, you know, <laughs> like Pete Seeger said, the truth is like grass. You know, it keeps coming up through the cracks in the side. Right. <laughs> and right. and uh, the truth is out there, you know. And I love that quote by Thomas Jefferson, you know, error requires the full support of government to support it. The truth stands by itself. Yeah. And uh, this is what motivates me because I feel like, you know, if I can, you know, calibrate and find the truth with, you know, snippets and putting things together, it stands by itself. I don't have to get out there and, uh, you know, eventually it's going to uh, carry the day. Because yeah. of nature of the universe. Right. But but the but the important you have to realize the important role you're playing. Because uh, there's a line from a from an old funny movie that I heard a long time ago. Uh, how did you how did you learn all this stuff or how do you know all this stuff? And the guy says, Well, it's hidden away in books. And it is hidden away in books. And it takes people like you that can that are good at research to go in there and dig it out and as you were saying in the beginning it's not just read this book and it's true read this book and it's true no you have to triangulate you have to know who's bullshitting you on this issue who's who's a, who's making a limited hangout here and uh, so it's really important that uh, what you're doing and uh, I'm looking forward to reading your article 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, you know, I have to I have to interject here uh, on this subject. You know, Alan Dulles was immediately appointed by Lyndon Johnson to the Warren Commission right after the Kennedy assassination. Of course. So here's the guy who was probably the CEO of the assassination, right. who was now the CEO of the Warren Commission. Right. And he went right in there with a book that said, uh, okay, in Europe they have conspiracies. But in America, we have lone nut killers. So yes. it should have been called the Dulles Commission because he exerted a lot more influence over the commission. And the CIA actually made it impossible for the Warren Commission to have their own fact-finding team. In right. other words, they had to use the facts that the CIA uh, had produced for them. So the CIA produces this bogus information which you know says that Lee Harvey Oswald is the lone nut killer. Right. Meanwhile, the Warren report was really quite long, and Alan Dulles has supposedly said, uh, "Well, go ahead and put that information in there. Americans don't read." Yeah. Americans don't read. That's what Dulles said. So put it in there. You know, in other words, hide it in plain sight. Hide the truth in Tell these right. books, and it is in these books if you read. And uh, that's why I encourage people to, to look at the, the, uh, the actual statements that are in this right. article and others. And that's why I quote others so much, because, you know, at my age, I'm not going to go out and do primary research. Uh, you don't need to. You don't yeah. need to. Yeah. And well, this, what, this is what makes the political correct movement so dangerous, because all this information that might conflict with your worldview is going to be summarily rejected because it doesn't fit with your worldview and it could be upsetting. So thought we, police. The thought uh, police, yeah, we're patrolling ourselves. But I think it's really good. It, it's interesting to note that the CIA is a full service agency. They create the bad guys, they kill the bad guys, and then they give you a report on what they did. So, you know, <laughs> go back yeah, to sleep. <laughs> go back to sleep. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm really happy to hear your comments now more. I, I think I've kind of basically handed over the, the, the headlines of, of, uh, of what's in here in, in this article. I think it fits very well with, uh, say, 911. Right. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, uh, it helps us to understand that, uh, say, you know, 911 is a CIA operation, CIA, right. Mossad, MI6, whatever some mixture thereof. Global warming, the fraud is uh, disinformation that all of these things are cover stories that conceal a real story. Right. So this is the way the CIA has always operated in and amongst itself, especially in their covert operations. The, the, the spy is going to have a cover and he's going to have a cover story. Well, as the spy agency takes over the entire country, as right. it has, then we are dealing with a world of cover stories and covers and lies. So uh, just like I quoted uh, Coleman, Dr. John Coleman, it, it used to be a mixture of fact and fiction, and now we've moved more towards just fiction, yeah. just lies. Yeah. And, and it's like the old analogy uh, when I was a kid, you know, that so-and-so is a weakling. He can't punch his way out of a paper bag. Well, finding the truth is like punching your way right. out of a paper bag you know it is and uh, it's like we got this wet paper bag on us which is a bunch of lies and uh, how do you get out of that so that you can see what's outside the wet paper bag right it's a it's a process and it's an interesting process I I'm a psychologist so I think in processes uh, some people have decided that they're tired of being tricked and fooled and bamboozled and they want to know Something motivated you in your upbringing to investigate Dulles. I've got to know this, this guy has been doing powerful things close to me all my life. I want to know. So, so you have the wherewithal and the brains to get in there and actually ferret it out and pull this guy out and identify him for what he is. And I think that's really, that's really important. And th that process is what we need, the process. And I call it the awakening because people just get, you know, I think we started coming out of it in 2006, but what supercharged us was uh, 
uh, McGovern's work, my McGowan's work. Right. My God, we we are nothing's been organic about our lives. Hey, I do have a question. While you were going over, you were talking about the uh, the puppeted uh, Cold War that happened most of our lives. We were involved in the Cold War and those bad Russians and have to keep up with them and all that crap. It seems like they were start, starting to do that again with this threat with Russia and Syria. And then they must have decided that they didn't need the Cold War strategy anymore, so they told Russia to back off. What was your, what, what, what's your estimation on, on what was going on there? Well, you know, Paul, you probably have a better sense than I. I I'm so plugged into my research and my books, right. and I'm so well aware that TV is a central part of the propaganda system that I don't watch TV at all. We don't either. And we I don't, don't watch many movies. So in terms of current events, I, 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 I let things go by sometimes. Yeah. I hear about them. I get uh, kind of the interpretation of uh, certain people which resonates or not. Uh, I listen to Tex Mars a lot on Power yeah. Prophecy, and I really like him until he brought on uh, Edward Henry recently, this uh, guy in the State Department who's written some really good books, um, who now is advocating the flat earth theory uh, and mixing it up with, uh, you know, Israel did it. Well, that's, again, that's, that's you know, mixing truth yeah, and lies. Yeah, that's right. Know? I mean, it's like... In fact, somebody just sent me that book about this flat earth coming around. Well, I mean, you know, the Catholic Church fought that battle with Copernicus back in the 1600s, and they lost. Right. I mean, we obviously, uh, science has proven a long time ago that we have, you know, Earth's not the center of the universe, uh, like you might believe from the Bible. And, uh, right. and to go back now and have a flat earth, I mean, that just that's called poisoning the well. You, you put this outrageous bit of disinformation in with some truth, right. and everything gets thrown out, you know. And now just... everything that De Edward Henry has written, and I've quoted him extensively in some of his books, uh, everything is suspect, because now he's, he's championing this ridiculous idea that the earth is flat. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a kind of a, this is the game of the intelligence agencies, to mix truth with lies. And then it becomes, again, our job to, to, to punch our way out of the paper bag. Tex Mars would have said uh, that Russia was coming in on the side of Syria, trying to, you know, threatening to take out ISIS, uh, which was destroying Syria. And uh, the ISIS is a creation of the CIA and the Mossad. Yeah. And that Syria was an enemy of Israel and the CIA because... Uh, um, it, it actually threatened to harbor people who were antagonistic to the uh, goals of Israel in the Middle East, which is to create a greater Israel from, you know, the Tigris to the Nile, and that's in the flag of, uh -huh. the, of the, the Rothschild flag for the state of Israel, is to take over the Middle East. And the United States is Israel's puppet now uh, to the extent that the tail is wagging the dog. Right, exactly. And we're the policemen for Israel and we've invaded what seven countries since 911. So this then becomes the real uh, story right. behind 911. The real story behind 911. We're given the cover, you know, yeah, that, the, that it was Osama bin Laden, and uh, right. that it was the Arabs. Well, in fact, uh, that's not true. And the real story is that it's justification or pretext to prosecute all these wars in the Middle East like the Iraq war where we've killed two or three or even four million people out of 22 million people, that's genocide. And the Afghanistan war, which is now longer than the Vietnam war. I think we've been at war since 2001 in Afghanistan, so that's 15 years with no real progress except control of Afghanistan and its resources. Yeah. And, uh, and it's again, it's the great game. Who's going to control Eurasia? And, and the... Uh, and the resources, two thirds of the world's exactly. people, two thirds of the world's resources in Asia, um, and for some reason, you know, all our military bases are encircling Russia and China now. Gee, why is that? Well, again, control of Eurasia, yeah. and all of this is like right out of the great game. So, again, it's the Anglo-American alliance now with Israel very much involved 
and Rothschilds created Israel uh, and designed the flag even. Um, so uh, this is, if you want, this is the axis of evil. It's Washington, yeah. uh, London, and Tel Aviv. Hey. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. I mean, these are the countries that didn't have a Rothschild central bank. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, of I, course, now Iraq does, you know. Right, I think, I think your comment is, uh, is, is really uh, telling in a couple ways. Not knowing about this or not hearing how the mainstream media is covering this particular event doesn't preclude you from having deep insight on it because you because you see them you see how they work you see who they are what they're doing and so any situation well okay knowing knowing the players what they're doing and where they're going here's probably what they're doing so uh, yeah and, they, and that's true but also I have my allies Tex Mars has a weekly power of prophecy program he was uh -huh. 22 year Air Force officer uh, he has written 47 books, uh, <laughs> and, and I get his take on it. And his, his interesting worldview is based on geopolitics, which he's uh -huh. always been interested in since a kid, and, uh, and biblical prophecy. So you put biblical prophecy with geopolitics. That's his, yeah. that's his starting point. And, uh, well, I don't know that much about biblical prophecy. I'm... I'm you know, kind of actually more interested in geopolitics, yeah. but I get both from text. So I have some good allies. That's good. So rather than, you know, wade through the, the disinformation in so much of the TV and, and, and uh, even so many of the newspapers, uh, nowadays I will find my allies right. and I'll get the insights from them. I think, that's, I think that's important. I think we all should be doing that. Hey, this has been a great interview, and I hope that um, we've been able to characterize what's going on and who these people are behind the scenes and how they've orchestrated just everything that we've gone through, uh, especially with international politics, how the Dulles brothers took out Kennedy uh, because he was uh, favoring people, I guess. He knew I think too he, much. Penn, Kennedy, you know, he was a patriot. Uh, Towards the end, nine days before his assassination, he says there is a plot yeah. uh, to uh, to destroy America being fomented in the White House that I have to tell the American people. Yeah, there's so many statements that he made. He was he was condemning the secret societies. He ha he had made moves to pull the CIA out of Vietnam. Yeah. He wanted to break the CIA into a thousand pieces and said so. He wanted to, in fact, he did reissue the Lincoln Greenbacks, which was right. uh, coined not by the Federal Reserve, this private bank owned by the European Bank Consortium, headed by Rothschild, but actually have money printed by Congress, which the Constitution calls for. Uh, he had reissued, he had gotten his master's at the London School of Economics. This, this man knew uh, economics. Right. He was a very smart individual. And, of course, he was also played by uh, the intelligence agencies, you know, with his trysts with, you know, Marilyn right. Monroe and whatnot. These were manipulated for him by them. But, but anyway, Kennedy was, I think, uh, a little like Lincoln in the sense that, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, was, he was very concerned about the American people. And uh, I don't know so much about Lincoln. I guess McGowan has a whole series that questions everything about the Lincoln assassination. Uh -huh. But uh, Kennedy, to me, comes off as the last president who thought he could do something, you know, run right. the country. And uh, and of course, he was uh, he was offed by the powers that <laughs> wouldn't accept that. That's right. And uh, there's a great Bill Hicks comedy s skit who. Uh, uh, he was big, I guess, in the 90s and 80s. He said, uh, okay, here's what happens when a president comes into the White House. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they take him up to the fourth floor and they show him the Zapruder film. And then they say, uh, any questions? Right. And, uh, and <laughs> That's Clinton great. says, uh, only one. What's my agenda? What's my <laughs> agenda? That's exactly right. Well, so in other words, we've had figureheads ever since Kennedy. And uh, it was a power struggle. Alan Dulles, you know, won. Right. Wall Street won. Uh, the city of London won. The Rothschilds won. 
And uh, this is, this is uh, uh, the American people have been lied to, manipulated, brainwashed into becoming the sharp edge of the American empire. Right. I don't think anybody in this country ever voted to say, let's conquer the world so that we can be the empire and kill all these other people. Right. Uh, but we, this is what happened. Um, right. You know, starting with the invasion in the Philippines uh, uh, right near the turn of the uh, 19th century into the 20th century. Since then, it has been, you know, progressively the American empire. And then, you know, it gets captured by, again, the, <laughs> the Wall Street uh, city of London, Rothschild, uh, British royal family, Tel Aviv axis, if you will, somewhere by night, well, really about the time of the Kennedy assassination. And uh, George H.W. Bush, total um, skull and bones, total uh, agent tour for the Illuminati. Under, under George H.W. Bush, he not only gives us the first war in Iraq, which as it turns out, you know, is, is Babylon, Right. And has all kinds of biblical implications uh, for the, you know, the return of the Antichrist and that sort of thing, which is why those interests want to control it and did way back, you know. Uh, he also signed off on Agenda 21 uh, of yeah. the United Nations back in 91, which would then bring us all into this new world order that... Uh, right. So you have the soft and the hard... Uh, conquest of the world, the soft conquest, United Nations Agenda 21, brings us into one world government, one world religion under the United Nations. Then you have the hard conquest, which is all these invasions, just like the neoliberal and the neoconservative. Right. So these are different as different ways to take down the world. Think of a pincer movement, you know. Yeah. And these guys are very smart, you know. And one can think, oh, gee, are they are they reptilians? Are they demons? I don't know, but they're very smart, <laughs> and they have their they have their techniques. And right. uh, uh, this, you know, playing countries off against each other, you know, playing ideologies and economic systems off against each other, all Hegelian dialectic stuff, right. thesis, antithesis, synthesis, to to move nations in the direction of their one world government, one world religion, which is Luciferian. Um, They've been working at this for a long time. They have. And I, you, we've done enough studies so that we actually do see the spiritual components to this. Right. Um, it's got very human face, and it's all, got also, I think, some very dark spiritual underpinnings. So yes. in that sense, I think finding and sharing the truth is, is our best defense. Um, let me just add that it was Alan Dulles who decided that the CIA motto should be and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free right out of the book of John wow. his father was a Presbyterian minister um, but if you look I think as John 8 33 but if you look at John 8 32 you see that it's taken out of context and what 8, John 8 32 says you know, something about following Jesus and his commandments. And then, yeah. and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall, shall set, set you free. free. So in other words, he forgot right. to mention. So there again, the you know, half a truth is worse than a whole lie. So he took that biblical context, biblical phrase out of context. It's in Langley, inscribed in the stones, you know, to give right. people the idea that what they're doing is holy. But what they're doing is actually not holy at all. Exactly, exactly. Well, this has been very unholy. <laughs> it is, and it still is. Hey, listen, we got to end it for today. Uh, we're going to have many more of these conversations because Eric is just a cornucopia of information, and he can go in and he can do the research, and he can give us all insights that we all really need to have to go forward. So thank you very much, Eric. For coming Thank in you, again. Paul. It's, it's, it's a pleasure, and thanks for letting me share this, uh, this work. Um, I do have members in the family who have been in the CIA. So you're a psychologist, you're interested in process, and uh, that, that world tangentially touched my life. Yeah. And uh, there is an element of secrecy there that uh, 
uh, I couldn't learn from talking to those individuals, but I have learned th through books. Yeah, so. great. That's so. God bless you, Eric, and uh, we'll talk to you an another time. Thank you, Paul, and God bless you.